I was recently scanning a chat on something that I was reading online. It was part of a conversation that was attached to an email that I had received and it was addressing the circumstances around Prince's death, the musician, on April 21 of 2016. Another one of those moments where you remember where you were when you heard something and I do because I was, I, I admit being very fond of Prince. Prince died at 57 years old after accidentally overdosing on fentanyl at his Paisley Park home and recording studio in Chanhassen, Minnesota. So this would have been on the front end of what is now become a plague of death. This was back when most of us weren't really familiar with the impact that fentanyl was going to have on our community and our close community. I had been in a early lifestyle of dance clubs. I was just into the club life and at, that was during the years where Prince was in his early career and so I was a huge Prince fan. I have absolutely nothing negative to say about him. He's a tremendously gifted artist in many ways. And I was amongst those that were caught totally by surprise when it was shared that he died of a drug overdose because most of us would not have guessed that with him. I would say that there's some things around his death that caused so much confusion for many that also hold lessons for many because a lot of us can get caught in a secret part of our lifestyle or a habit that we work to keep hidden at all cost. And it, it appears that's what happened with him. And I certainly feel compassion for that. I feel um, kindred to that. I feel amazingly blessed that I lived through the many times that applied to me. Even as a Christian that has happened, I feel like that is such a treacherous corner to get yourself in that it's a miracle to get out. It's the mercy of God that you get exposed, but many don't and many die. And the thing that you need privacy to do to keep doing, that ends up causing your death. Where if you wouldn't have been alone or if it wasn't so private, someone could have saved your life. And in this case, that's what apparently and obviously probably did happen. Our secrets can kill us spiritually and physically. So spiritually, it can happen even before physically. So we see people who seem to get up very well um, once they come to know Christ, they seem to get up very well. They get up and moving and around that company, they seem to take off and show all signs of, of a good, solid life of following Jesus. But then many tell me that it was when they got their phone back that it all stopped because then something started happening on that phone that took everything else down. And it's not something that they came running to anyone to help them with either. They kept that a secret, but everybody could tell everything changed. Nobody knew what it was though until it's too late, everything's gone. But our secrets must be taken seriously while we still have the opportunity because many people die as a result of their secrets. And Wikipedia reports that Prince saw a Twin City specialist in family medicine in Excelsior on April 7th, 2016. So that was less than two weeks before he died. And he saw this person again on April 20th, one day, 
before he died. On April 7th, he postponed two performances at the Fox Theater in Atlanta while on tour, and the venue released a statement saying that he had influenza. He rescheduled and performed what ended up being his final show on April 14th, still not feeling well, and then while flying back to Minneapolis early the next morning, he became unresponsive and his private jet made an emergency landing at the Quad Cities International Airport in Moline, Illinois, where he was hospitalized and received naloxone, a medication used to block the effects of opioids, especially and usually following an overdose. And once he became conscious, he left against medical advice those speaking for him reported that he was dehydrated and that he had had influenza for several weeks. The next day, he was seen bicycling in his hometown of Chanhassen, Minnesota. That evening, he shopped at a record store in Minneapolis and he made a brief appearance at a dance party at his Paisley Park recording studio, stating that he felt fine. On April 19th, he attended a performance at the Dakota Jazz Club. On April 20th, his team called a California specialist in addiction medicine and pain management seeking medical help for Prince. This addiction specialist was scheduled to meet with him on April 22nd. He then contacted a local physician who cleared his schedule for a physical exam on April 21st. And on April 21st at 9.43 a.m., the Carver County Sheriff's Office received a 911 call requesting an ambulance to be sent to Prince's home at Paisley Park. And the caller initially told the dispatcher that an unidentified person at the home was unconscious. Then moments later, he said, he's dead. And then he identified the person eventually as Prince. The caller was the son of the addiction specialist who had flown in a prescription that treats opioid use disorder. So he arrived that morning to create a treatment plan for opioid addiction. Emergency responders found Prince unresponsive in an elevator, performed CPR, but a paramedic said he had already been dead for at least six hours and they were unable to revive him. They pronounced him dead at 10.07 a.m., 19 minutes after they arrived. No signs of suicide or foul play, and a press release from the Midwest Medical Examiner's Office in Anoka County on June 2nd stated that the musician had died of an accidental overdose of fentanyl at the age of 57. The fentanyl that led to his overdose was contained in counterfeit pills made to look like a generic version of the painkiller hydrocodone. And the question of how and from what source Prince obtained that drug that led to his death has been the subject of investigations by multiple law enforcement agencies. On April 19th of 2018, two years later, the Carver County attorney announced that the multi-agency investigation related to the circumstances of the star's death had ended with no criminal charges filed. And while reports have come out to indicate that it was very likely Prince did not know he was taking fentanyl, he may have acquired and taken mislabeled counterfeit pills that he thought contained a much less powerful opioid. At that time, like I said, we had no idea how common this exact thing was going to become. There are people who are actually addicted to fentanyl, but there's a lot more that have died that did not know fentanyl was in the drug that they were sold. We encountered a family recently who knew it wasn't fentanyl because they said they don't even do opiates. But sadly, in these instant overdose deaths, doesn't matter if it's meth, cocaine, 
there's commonly fentanyl present. Comments from Prince's family members report that he was not a drug addict and that they thought there was something suspicious right away surrounding his death. I think that was a pretty common reaction to his death. Most people would have never agreed that he was a drug addict. It appears he was at least somewhat adjusted to opiate use, however, because he was able to perform, take care of business as usual without anyone noticing or thinking that he was high. It is possible he obtained a lace batch this time, and we now know, obviously, that this happens frequently, but back then it was kind of hard to understand that. Most interesting was this comment and why I chose to share this story. The comment came from someone who knew him that said, his need for privacy ended up killing him. And I can actually really relate to that. It's possible that his need for privacy could have been financially related because promoters have to take out insurance on an artist and if anyone suspected that he had that level of joint problems, that he was needing um, hydrocodone, he would have very likely had trouble getting bookings, it was suggested, and he made the bulk of his money from live performing. There could have been... Um, multiple reasons for why he kept this level of use secret but in the end none of those reasons even matter because he died another possible reason for the secrecy given was his inability to show weakness he had once said he felt like he raised himself since he was 12 and if you feel that you have to look after yourself that young and from then on you realize you can't depend on anyone. You sure aren't going to present as weak. And he showed that point to be clear by how successful he was in business and the way that he handled that industry. He had the musical industry. He was also made movies. He ran a very large business. At one point, he had six to 800 people working for him. So asking for help was frightening, and it appeared that it was very hard for him to bring himself to that point until it was too late. When he asked for help, the help arrived, and they found him dead. And there's just many things about this story that give me chills because... It shouldn't be any different for any person, whether it's Prince or someone else that dies this way. It's tragic. I, I am a firm believer that no one, when they ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up in your, let's say, kindergarten or first grade, you know, no one says, I'm going to grow up to be a drug addict. No one says that. But too many of us, end up there and I've talked about the reasons many times but this is not that conversation Luke 18 17 says for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light and here's the frightening thing about this look at all the chatter and the talking and the rumors and the stories and the slander and the made up garbage that comes out about people after they die, especially a death that involves substance use. It is absolutely stunning what all gets put out in the milieu and the mix and open social media. I see why people crave privacy around these situations. It's merciless out there for those who have substance users, substance abusers. We don't even need to sort them out. This just automatically attaches a label to people. Many almost confirm by how they respond that people who are addicted to drugs and die deserve what they get. It is just heinous how people judge people who many times 
were so severely traumatized as a young person and left alone in that. In this case, if you've got a man who's a super small stature like Prince was, raising himself from the age of 12, there, in the city, there's nothing about that that is not traumatic. Luke 12, 3 confirms, Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. That should worry some people because that means everything that's been spoken is going to become public and we see that happen when someone dies ecclesiastes 12 14 adds for god will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil mark 4 22 says for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest nor is anything secret except to come to light Hebrews 4.13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Romans 2.16, On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. 1 John 1, 6-7 If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. I... I'm surprised how often I hear from people who are actively sinning that they have a good relationship with Jesus Christ. I honestly, that is the most deceptive thing someone can believe. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus Christ and live in sin in any way. There is no biblical possibility for that by choosing to keep sinning in whatever way it is you have denied Christ that's how God sees it if you are in fellowship with Christ you have denied sin that's how God sees it GodQuestions.org gives some reasons how people end up in this terrible position with God. They mentally consent that they're okay with God, but their lives remain in their own control. And the ultimate deception is what causes many to lose out on heaven without even expecting it. This sudden death is happening to many. There's so many just crazy, random, fatal heart attacks anymore in young people. It's, it's mind-boggling. Things we've never seen before are happening and killing people instantly at a young age. Four reasons given that can serve as general categories as to how. One, some people don't think they need a savior. And this oftentimes is because their needs are being met. I certainly do not condone addiction. It is idolatry. It is sin against God. But many people are using addiction as solace because they don't know how to come to God, which is our position. We must tell them. These people consider themselves to be basically good, and they do not realize that they, like all people, are sinners who cannot come to God on their own terms. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. And those who reject Christ will not be able to stand before God and plead any kind of case about their merits or excuses, what they intended, and they just got throttled suddenly into eternity. 
and this is a very large group and many of them are sitting in the church every Sunday sadly many are working in ministry even and they believe they're good people they believe God um, blesses them because they are good people another is the fear of social rejection or persecution that stops many from a surrender to Christ that would put a stop to the addiction surrendering to Christ means I die Christ lives in me and he is not addicted he does not share his house with a lethal substance so if you want to be free of addiction like I am like many around me are surrendering to Jesus Christ is the answer I'm not saying you won't need help with trauma things like that different conversation but to get free of sin surrender to Jesus and if you need help with that we would love to help you the unbelievers in John 12 42 to 43 would not confess Christ because they were more concerned with their status amongst their peers than in doing God's will the way God wanted it done many people choose their own calling they choose their own ministry position they choose they choose their ministry position as a career they have not heard from God and you can tell they have not heard from God there is no anointing in what they do there is no power that creates a supernatural response that would be there if it was a calling from God himself it's a career usually for pay and these are the Pharisees that love the position and the esteem of others and it has blinded them to the truth the Bible says for they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God and notice that he called them unbelievers he doesn't even say that they're Christians people who are seeking to be seen and impress man are not believers they are not followers of Jesus because if they were they would be seeking one thing only and that is to exalt Jesus Christ another is for some people the things that the world presents to them has more to offer and it's more appealing than eternal things and there was a man in Matthew 19 16 to 23 that was not willing to lose his earthly possessions in order to gain an eternal relationship with Jesus and I have to admit continuously being perplexed by the current large group of those claiming to be evangelical Christians who are market obsessed they are portfolio obsessed they are so concerned about the stability of their own personal economy while the entire world is collapsing it's pretty clear to see where this is going and I don't care what you do to prop up your portfolio it's not likely going to help in the end because when this happens there is no amount of money that is going to be able to stop the judgment of God on this world there's no amount of money that can keep you out of hell I don't care what or any religion says I came to the end of my life through addiction severe chronic addiction and I knew that day and I said it to someone someone could hand me a million dollars today and I would hand it back I have no use for a million dollars because I had lost my mind I wouldn't even know what to do with it I knew it would have no use for me at this point because I was past being able to be excited about money money could not have helped me that day but many in the world and in the church remain very fixated on money being the solution for their well-being for their future for pretty much everything 
And this is a good reason why it appears God is bringing it all down because it's going to keep a lot of people from heaven if he doesn't. It's his mercy to crash economics around people. Another is many are simply resisting the Holy Spirit's attempts to draw them to obedience in Jesus Christ. Stephen was a leader in the early church and he told those who were about to stone him to death in Acts 7.51, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Paul made a similar statement to a group of gospel rejectors who also didn't want the Holy Spirit freed up in Acts 28.23 through 27. It's a very, very dangerous position to take when you take control in your mind of the Holy Spirit. First of all, there is no such thing. You either let him have his way or you don't have him. He doesn't follow our little scripts. Whatever the reason that people reject Jesus Christ, often in times it's financial, some financial reason, their time because they have other things they want to do with their time besides be a Jesus follower. Well, they'll wait. They'll, they'll come to it in time, they feel. But at this time, they have more priorities than serving Jesus. Relationships are a huge one. I have fallen into that numerous times myself. I have been convicted of that in actual friendships since I was a believer that there are relationships God does not want us to have and he has made it clear to let them go and we're basically benched until we do. People's choice of work oftentimes is a reason that they reject Jesus as Lord. They think they've got him as Savior, but they just say, I can't at this moment make him Lord. They are lost. There is no such thing as Jesus as Savior, but not Lord of all. You are still lost. Possessions, people have a lot of toys and they want a life of enjoying those toys, not serving and following Jesus yet. This, all of these, and the other mix of things, even the religious, working, striving, um, all the religious things that you can do without being in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ have disastrous eternal consequences. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. Acts 4.12 And those who reject him as Lord of all, Lord of every single part of our life, Lord of every choice we make, those who don't allow him that complete authority in their life, for whatever reason, face an eternity in outer darkness of hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, according to Matthew 25, 30. God will not take second place to any other love, which oftentimes is our own self-pleasure, self-gratification, what I love to do. And we cannot judge God for this because he calls this a marriage, bride and bridegroom. We would never tolerate that ourselves. I've said that many times. People can't think God is rigid because you don't allow your spouse to have you as second and someone else is their first priority. No one wants that. Every one of us has a secret life known only to God. Everyone. And what we really are is what that secret life is. When no one's around, every single part of us is connected to that secret life. That is the core right there. And God knows exactly who we are in secret. And he knows that's exactly who we are, is who we are in secret. And Jesus spoke to his disciples specifically about this secret life in Matthew 6, 1 through 18, and five times he rep repeated the words in secret. Our secret life is seen by God, every single detail, every sound, every thought, 
every thought into preparing, every thought into fantasizing, everything is seen by God. Psalm 139, 7 through 11 says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to, into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there will your hand be and your right hand will hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, we cannot hide from God. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Psalm 91, 1 says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, because there is a secret place in God's secret place. That's the only secret place and secret life that he approves of, is the one that is in his secret place. God requires clean hands. He requires a pure heart. In Matthew 6, he addresses a hypocrisy shown in three functions that the religious claim, the giving of money, prayer, and fasting. Everything we do must come down to, am I doing this to worship Jesus or for some other reason? And God is the one keeping track of the motives of every choice. He's careful to record our why behind what we do. In Jeremiah 17, 9 through 19, God says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And this is another verse that condemns and puts a stop to anyone thinking that their heart is actually good that God knows their heart. This is what he knows. He says otherwise. He says it is desperately wicked. Everyone. God does want us to have a life that is joyful. There certainly is not going to be ease in most of our life because he does promise trials and difficulties. But the thing about that is he is so close, and I have experienced that many times in really, really hard times, that the close, God comes so near in the hardest things that you end up wishing for that, not for hard things, but you wish, you, you just remember how close God was. He knows if we're going to share that with him, He's going to be as close as the mention of his name. And it's very, very different from what most people think. It's kind of like this hand just comes down under you and holds you. He's eager to help us overcome our secret life also, if it's not the kind that he approves of. He planned way ahead for that cleansing. He knew many of us were going to get this wrong but he also knew some of us would be just desperate to get back to him. He's made a way to resist temptation also so that this cleansing is not needed. That is the better way, but he has made a way for us to be cleansed of our secret life. So if we take care of our secret life, God will take care of our public life. But if we take care of our public life and not our secret life, we should never expect God to bless us or for our labors to be blessed because he sees what we are in our secret life and he says that is the true us. Charles Spurgeon says, If any man pleases God, he does that which conduces most to his own temporal and eternal welfare. We want to do many things in our own strength, but our Lord so desires that we look to him in every part of our lives as we do that, he will bless and use us exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 The urgent thing is we need to reflect on our own secret life because we all have one. So everyone needs to look at the secret life that they have and examine it for what it is. Are we being transformed inside and out to the likeness of Christ? 
Are we hiding the word of God deep into our hearts so that we won't sin when temptation comes? What God sees when he looks into our secret life, is that what you want playing out on the big screen in front of everyone who knows you? Are you comfortable with that? Are there thoughts and attitudes that we need to confess so that God can forgive and cleanse us? The secret life is definitely something we want to attend to. Aaron Davis writes about what many of us see often. And sadly, this type of an example so tarnishes those who, are, who should be seeing Jesus in us. And it causes many others to either think that they came to Christ to live a compromised life or to simply wash their hands completely of this because they feel that Christians are all hypocrites. They think that if a person says how much they love Jesus, why do they act the way that they do? The world itself sees the, the error in that thinking. But they also watch the people who are sinning and say how much they love Jesus and that their great love for Jesus covers over a multitude of sin, which is a complete misrepresentation of the word. They know it too. I have done that. I know sin has been in my life and there is no chance that I think for a second I'm going to get away with it. I don't care what excuses I've made. I know. Anyone who represents Jesus is expected to confront this behavior if they see it in someone. If it's presented in front of you, this kind of shabby representation of Christ, you need to address it. If you're the one who sees it, you should address it. God holds us responsible for each other. There will be blood on our hands if we let someone just keep on going thinking that they were going to that there wasn't going to be an eternal consequence for that. Steward the gospel with all of your strength and all of your resolve because it's the only thing that is going to survive this world. You have no other reason to be involved in any ministry except to carefully steward the truth of the gospel. That's the only point of even being in any ministry role or claiming to be a follower of Christ. Steward the tremendously valuable message of the cross. Ms. Aaron writes of a double life of a young woman she was mentoring that was recently exposed. On the outside, this young woman seemed to be living her life for Jesus. She smiled all the time. She wore Christian t-shirts. She never missed church. She talked about faith and purity and living to please the Lord. And that's why those who loved her were shocked when they discovered that she was secretly living in sexual sin. And for months, she had been living in this double life, one as a young woman committed to Christ and one as a young woman choosing to sin repeatedly. When double lives are exposed, hearts are broken, lives are torn apart, families are torn apart. Sin's power to deceive and destroy is on full display when someone is exposed. Worse is if God didn't let you be exposed and you went to hell for eternity for this public shaming of the cross repeatedly with no repentance and all excuses, constant excuses, constant lying. Many are leading double lives. Many in the church are leading double lives. They live one way at church and with family and some anyone else. Their, their personality at church and their personality everywhere else are two separate things. Or they are one person completely with all other people at every level, but then behind their closed door, they have a pattern of sin that they cannot break free from because they keep it a secret. They keep it a secret because they keep it. People refuse to confess their sin and ask for accountability on purpose because they keep it. And God sees every time they do it, 
has a choice to keep it and not repent of it and run for help from someone else, even another person who has gotten free from that same thing. There are many of us who have been buried in sin. We understand. We understand the not wanting to come forward, but we also know where we would be if we didn't. In this day of everything being high tech, many think it's okay to be one person at home and a different person with others. Online, online is crazy. We, people, everyone almost seems schizophrenic. Depends on the subject. People just fire off all kinds of crazy stuff. Watching people professing Christ use the F word on Facebook is just stunning. It's just so disconcerting. And somehow when we see this and it's somehow seen and seen and seen, it conditions other people to think that this is acceptable. And all leaders, anyone leading, please be careful. We are responsible for not just Jesus, but others. And we need to be extremely careful in our representation. We're not representing ourselves. We are representing Christ. Many claiming to be loyal to Jesus feel no remorse when they're trash talking someone else, using profanity, talking about sex and others as if their purpose for sex, sexting, bullying online through intimidation, controlling and intimidating people in the home, in work, social settings, on social media. I don't care who you are. You can sing in the church choir. You can, you can be the pastor. You can speak of Jesus all the time. But if you are one person, one place, and someone else entirely in a different place, you are a fraud. It's that simple. You're a fraud. And the result of living a double life is going to cause you great pain. And I would get it out of the way before I met Jesus face to face. This happens when we mentally justify two different types of behavior. And the Bible calls this being double-minded. James 1.8 says that a double-minded person is unstable in everything that they do. James 4.8 says, come near to God. He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Jesus despises double-mindedness, especially in those claiming to be religious. And that's why he often called them out publicly. In Matthew 23, 27 to 28, he said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Being double-minded is sin. Living like two different people does not honor God ever, and it is not accepted by Him. I don't care how much Christianese language you know. I don't care what kind of a Christianese display of behavior you share out around certain people, you are a fraud. The only solution to God is asking him to make us clean. Not just clean of your specific pet sins, clean of yourself entirely. We are to deny self. If we are in Christ, self is dead. There is no more rights to any kind of anything. Self has been laid down to live for Jesus. So if you're living a double life separated by who you are in public and who you are in secret, the cost of your hypocrisy is higher than you can imagine. Because as much as you think you're pulling it off, the whole world knows you're not. Even people who don't know Christ, they're even more savvy than you are. They can see that you are your life is a lie and it makes the cross, it shames the cross. That's the worst thing about it. Psalm 86, 11 says, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. 
Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. John 3, 19 said, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And this is why people hide and protect sin. One reason. They love it. That's the reason. They make up many other reasons that sound biblical or sound something, but the judge of that sin has already spoken. And he said, because they love it, that's why they keep it. He also says it in John 3, 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Or Romans 1, 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Jeremiah 16, 17, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. Isaiah 29, 15, Woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord, and whose deeds are done in a dark place. And they say, Who sees us or who knows us? If you have a sinful secret life, choices that you keep hidden from others people may see you as the lie that you present they may even think that you're living a holy life but you're not and god is not deceived in daniel 2:22, he said he reveals deep and secret things he knows what is in darkness and light dwells with him david said oh god you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you psalm 69 5 Psalm 98, 90 verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Do not live a sinful secret life and think that God doesn't mind just because he hasn't interfered with your secret life. Nothing is hidden from God. You cannot hide anything from him. He says, for my eyes are on all of their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. And first I will repay double for their iniquity and their sin because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable idols. Jeremiah 16, 17 through 18. What God comprehends he says is our path and our lying down. He's acquainted with all of our ways. He knows the words from our tongue. He knows everything all together. Psalm 139, three through four. And the day is coming. For some, it'll be today. For many, it will be tonight. Some of us have no idea. Well, none of us have any idea when that moment's gonna come for us. I can probably bet that Prince had no idea he was going to die in an elevator and not be found for six hours. The day is coming when everything hidden is going to be exposed. And oftentimes, even in this life, not in eternity, someone's affair, their crime, their lies are exposed because one small thing leads to another and people find out crazy things when one small thing leads to another one careless drop one careless word and it springs open the whole thing and some people are buried with honor only for scandals that rubbish their names to break out after they died and Ravi Zacharias is the one that I thought of when this happened. One of the greatest apologists. And I remember someone telling me, I cannot listen to any preacher except him. He is so profound. He is so interesting to listen to. I just love listening to him speak. And then he passed away on May 19th of 2020. And almost instantly, scandal after scandal was exposed. Now I, you can go to the, I love half price bookstores, but you can go there and his books are on the shelf with 
Bill Hybels with other books. You could have never found these books a few years ago because these men, their resale was high. But now you can't even give these books away because scandal has brought them down. Their name is aligned with scandal. Never mistake God's silence for ignorance or weakness. He's giving you time to repent and turn from your sin. Paul said, don't you realize how kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you, or don't you even care? Can't you see how kind he has been in giving you time to turn from your sin? Romans 2.4 Don't be one of the people who assumes on the mercy of God, continues to profess love for him, but also you keep your sin. You are a betrayer of Jesus by choice. You know you are. You're a cheater, you're a liar, and you're an abuser to Jesus. Second Peter 3 9 said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's continuing to be kind. He's continuing to desire us as we're continuing to assume that those days of kindness and his desire for us will allow us a little bit more time with our affair. God will ultimately judge everyone's secret life. And Paul said the day will surely come when God by Jesus Christ will judge everyone's secret life. This is my message. Romans 2 16 and he's going to punish those who live their lives in disobedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 7 through 8 speaks of when Jesus will be revealed from heaven with all of his angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They know it but they don't obey it. Verses 9 and 10 says they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because of what was testified about him. I would repent now. God is calling everyone in the world to repentance not to continue our sinful, salacious, pleasurable lifestyles, whether it's secretly or openly. We are in the last hour. And don't feel secure because your secret sins have not been exposed as some other people have been exposed. That's actually success on the side of the devil. If yours isn't exposed and you continue to keep it a secret and do it, the devil is winning. The devil is winning in your life. Every day that you get to keep your double life is a win for Satan. 1 Timothy 5, 24 through 25 warns, remember that some people lead sinful lives and everyone knows they will be judged. But there are others whose sin will not be revealed until later. In the same way, everyone knows how much good some people do, but there are others whose good deeds won't be known until later. So don't ever mix up your good reputation with what your true character is because God knows who you are in secret and that's far more important to him than who you are in public. Romans 2, 5 through 6 says, but no, you won't listen. You're storing up terrible punishment for yourself because of your stubbornness in refusing to turn from your sin. For there's going to come a day of judgment when God, the just judge of all the world, will judge all people according to what they have done. So please listen and do not store up terrible punishment for yourself because of your stubbornness in refusing to turn from your sin. God does not owe us one more chance. He does not owe us one more day. He does not owe us anything. Someone messaged me today saying, I don't understand. I think their girlfriend went back to using was the issue. And he said, I don't understand why God says he promises me a good life and then this keeps happening. Um, God did not promise us a good life in that sense at all. We have earned hell. God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing. 
that he is allowing us the choice of heaven should make us pinch ourselves in disbelief. Do not consider yourself in control of your situation before an all-wise and an all-knowing God. Many think that somehow they're going to pull off the switch in time. But generally speaking, that group is not allowed the chance. They've made their choice. Don't exhaust God's kindness, his tolerance, and his patience. Don't purposefully exhaust God's kindness and patience. Stop all secret sin. It's an open book before God at all times. One of the biggest issues being pornography, sexting, just know God is seeing every single thing that is going into your eyes. There is no chance that you can consider yourself following Jesus if Jesus is not your first priority in what you watch and what you do with that phone. Please don't live one more day showing Jesus that what he died to free you from you simply cannot live without. If you're not born again, you need to admit that you're a sinner and that you cannot save yourself. There is no prayer that can save you. You have to repent of your sin, which means turn completely from it. You have to lay down all rights to sin and self. You confess Jesus, not just Savior, but Lord of all. Renounce your past way of life, your relationship with the devil, and yourself, all of self. You walk away from it. You cannot have Jesus without doing that. Give full control of your life to Jesus Christ. Start attending a Bible-believing church, a Bible study, somewhere where they'll teach you the Bible because you have to know the one that you are putting in control of your life and what that will entail for you. You have to know that. It is your absolute responsibility to know who he is and what he requires. You cannot blame that on your pastor or anyone else. If you stand before Jesus and you don't know, you can easily know. Grow in Christ in all things and become everything that God wants you to be. And if there's anything that is confusing or you need help with um, surrendering to Christ or you need help with anything knowing about Christ, we are, that is our one passion, is bringing people into the kingdom the right way. We would be privileged to help you. Precious Lord, I am marvel that I am saved. Every single day I marvel that I am saved because I see so many that the struggle is so intense and they just keep fighting and you literally crashed mine to a screeching halt to stop my sin and then you saved me. I owe my life completely to you. I owe every single thing I do to you. And I do take what you did for me very seriously. I am passionate to please you, Jesus. Forgive me for all of the many ways that self interrupts anything. I ask that you would help us all to be so disgusted and sick of self and pleasure and everything that's replacing the frantic desire that you have right now to grab more before time is done. So many are dying, more so than we've ever seen. Help us to be about one thing, and that is saving others before eternity becomes their reality. 
We pray for revival, Jesus. We ask that you would just blow out revival all around us. That you would crash the idolatry, take down the idols. Help us to be ready and to be part of. We desire to be part of what you are planning to do. So we love you and I ask that your Holy Spirit fire would go out to absolutely everyone who hears and bring them to the most amazing intimate relationship with you that is possible. Touch them, touch them personally. Make it so clear that they know that the hand of God just touched them and work miracles in their lives and their families for all of eternity. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.